Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing gastric acid secretions. Okay, so we're currently looking at the pathway downstream of the H2 receptor, and we've got to the point where uh, the adenylyl cyclase enzymes have produced cyclic AMP, and we want to see the targets of cyclic AMP uh, within the cell. Okay, so we're currently discussing protein kinase A, of which there are two forms. There is uh, type 2 protein kinase A, which I'll just abbreviate to PKA, so type 2 PK, which is the form of protein kinase A, uh, which is anchored to uh, A kinase anchoring proteins, which themselves are bound uh, to the plasma membrane. Okay, so these type 2 protein kinase A membranes are hence uh, bound near the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. Now, type 2 protein kinase A consists, at least the inactive form, consists of two type 2 regulatory subunits along with two catalytic subunits, which I'm showing here in blue. So these are catalytic subunits. And uh, basically, you'll see from the way that I have drawn these regulatory subunits that they have these little invaginations here, two um, invaginations for each of the uh, regulatory subunits, okay? And these basically are the cyclic AMP binding sites. So each regulatory subunit... <coughs> Excuse me. Each regulatory subunit uh, has two cyclic AMP binding sites, which means that the whole complex, which is the type 2 protein kinase A, has four cyclic AMP binding sites. And often people use uh, the term R2C2 to describe the uh, protein kinase A, basically, because it's a complex of two regulatory subunits with two catalytic subunits. Okay, so this is a type 2 protein kinase A, which has these regulatory subunits of the second type. Now, let me show you a type 1 protein kinase A. Now, basically, type 1 protein kinase A um, proteins are uh, just free within the cytoplasm of the cell rather than being anchored to these A kinase anchoring proteins which themselves are bound uh, to the plasma membrane. Okay, so here, let's let this represent our type 1 protein kinase A. And the difference between type 1 and type 2 protein kinase A is that in type 1 protein kinase A, the regulatory subunit, uh, well, the two regulatory subunits, are type 1 regulatory subunits, which are abbreviated as R1. But the catalytic subunits here are identical to the catalytic subunits of the type 2 protein kinase A's. Okay, so in cells you have these two types of protein kinase A, type 1 protein kinase A and type 2 protein kinase A. And the difference between them lies in which uh, regulatory subunits you use. So, uh, for this type 1 protein kinase A, I will colour in the type 1 regulatory subunit in orange, like so. Okay, right. So, uh, basically, what's going to happen is when cyclic AMP goes up, it's going to activate these two different forms of protein kinase A. Okay, so four cyclic AMP molecules will bind in the cyclic AMP binding sites of a protein kinase A molecule, and this is for both type 1 and type 2 protein kinase A. So you'll get a cyclic AMP binding here, a cyclic AMP binding here, a cyclic AMP binding here, and another one binding here, and likewise for the type 2 protein kinase A over here. Okay, when that happens, the regulatory subunits, whether they're regulatory type 1 subunits or regulatory type 2 subunits, will change conformation and they'll release the catalytic subunits. And the catalytic subunits will then become activated. And this is probably something I should have stressed a long time ago, that when the catalytic subunits are bound to the regulatory subunits, they are not active, they are not capable of phosphorylating serine and threonine residues. It's only once the regulatory subunit has changed conformation and then release the catalytic subunit off, that it can then add phosphate groups onto serine and threonine residues. Okay, so let me show you this process happening. Okay, so uh, let's do it for type 1 protein kinase A. So basically, when cyclic AMP binds uh, the type 1 regulatory subunit, but it, the principle is exactly the same for the type 2 regulatory subunit as well, except that the regulatory subunits will, in the type 2 case, remain bound to the A cap. Okay, so uh, basically, 
when cyclic AMP molecules bind, and I'll just show the cyclic AMP molecules as blobs, okay, so they've been downgraded from having that rather intricate cartoon drawn of them to just being shown now as blobs, okay, and I'll colour in cyclic AMP in blue. Basically, what happens is the regulatory subunits change conformation, and in the form of this cartoon, I'm showing that change in conformation quite dramatically by showing them having gone from being in an L shape to being in this sort of rod shape, basically. And once this has happened, the regulatory subunits will no longer bind to the catalytic subunits. Okay, so the catalytic subunits can then go off. So I'll cover, cover these catalytic subunits in turquoise here. Okay, and they will phosphorylate serine and threonine residues on whichever proteins they come into contact with. Now, I should just stress that it's not just any old serine or threonine residue. They don't just go around and uh, phosphorylate random serine and threonine residues. They, it has to be a special serine or threonine residue known as a phosphorylation site. Okay, so if this is the type 1 regulatory subunit here, then of course they will just remain in the cytoplasm, and the two regulatory subunits do remain dimerized together. If we're talking about a type 2 regulatory subunit, they remain bound to the A kinase anchoring protein. Okay, so this is either R1 or R2. Right, okay, so... Uh, let's now discuss in a bit more detail what these catalytic subunits are going to do. So they're going to phosphorylate serine and threonine residues. So let me draw out for you the structure of a serine and then a threonine residue. Okay, so here's the amino terminus. Here's the alpha carbon with the hydrogen coming off it. And then here's the carboxylic acid group. So I'm drawing these uh, serine and threonine amino acids as though they're incorporated into proteins. Now, the way to say that is that you're drawing a serine and threonine residue, basically. When people talk about amino acid residues within proteins, they mean the amino acid structure as though it's bound within a polypeptide. So basically, this amino group, I've drawn it as though it's bound to a carboxylic acid group of the uh, amino acid in front of it. And this carboxylic acid group back here, I've drawn it as that's bound to the amino group of the amino acid after it. Okay, and the R group, let's say this is going to be a serine amino acid. So the R group of serine is a methylene group with an alcohol group coming off. Okay, so this is serine. And then let me show you threonine as well. Okay, so here is again the amino acid. Um, core structure, so the amino group, the alpha carbon, then the carboxylic acid group here, and the R group of threonine basically uh, is very similar to serine except that you have an extra methyl group which I will put here, so you have a methyl group, a CH3 group here with an alcohol group coming off, so this is threonine. Okay, so basically what can happen to these serine and threonine residues is that uh, the alcohol group in both of them can end up being phosphorylated. Okay, now I'll show this uh, as though we're binding an inorganic phosphate group on. But of course, when these catalytic subunits actually attach phosphate groups, they do not take inorganic phosphate groups from the uh, cytoplasm and attach them on. Instead, uh, what they do is they take ATP molecules, they cut the gamma phosphate off, and they attach it onto these alcohol groups. But I'll show it to you as though we're actually linking an inorganic phosphate to get the concept of phosphorylation across. Okay, right. So this is the structure of an inorganic phosphate group. It consists of a phosphorus atom double bound to an oxygen atom, then with two alcohol groups coming off, and then also a single bond to another oxygen. And of course, that doesn't uh, saturate this oxygen, so it has to gain another electron via ionic means to take its outer shell electron number up to eight. Okay, uh, now, basically what can happen is phosphate groups like this can form a link with alcohol groups known as a phosphoester link. And the way I would encourage you to think of this is if you imagine removing this phosphorus atom here and replacing it with a carbon atom. So imagine replacing that with a carbon atom 
Forget the fact that it's got five bonds off it, which doesn't make sense if it's a carbon atom. Uh, but look at this structure here. If this was a carbon atom, this would be a carboxylic acid group here. And we know that carboxylic acid groups can react with alcohol groups to produce esters. So basically, this phosphate group that we've got here can interact with this alcohol group just like a carboxylic acid uh, would. And it well, if that phosphorus atom was a carbon atom and we were dealing with a carboxylic acid group, then we call the link that it makes between uh, the carboxylic acid group and the alcohol group, we call that an ester link. Instead here, we're going to call it a fire, uh, sorry, a phosphoester link. I was about to say phyroester then, uh, but no, a phosphoester link. Okay, so... Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to take this alcohol group off the phosphate group. We're going to take that hydrogen off the alcohol. We'll combine those two things together to make water. And then we'll bind this oxygen here of the serine or, or of the threonine uh, to the phosphorus atom. And now, basically, that link there is known as the phosphoester link. Okay, and we now have a phosphorylated serine residue, or if we were dealing with threonine, it would be a phosphorylated threonine residue. Okay, so this is what the catalytic subunits are going to do, but they're going to get these phosphate groups from ATP rather than just from inorganic phosphate uh, groups that are uh, within the cytoplasm. Okay, right. Uh, so... Overall, then, what have we seen so far? Activation of the H2 receptor has led to the activation of these catalytic subunits. Basically, what these catalytic subunits are going to do is they're going to phosphorylate and activate uh, the proton potassium ATPase, which, remember, is this protein which uh, exchanges two protons for two potassium ions. It pumps two protons out into the canaliculi, okay, and in exchange brings two potassium ions back in, okay, and every time it does this, it uh, uses ATP, basically. Now, remember, this is the entire driving force for the secretion of hydrochloric acid, okay? So this protein drives the secretion of hydrochloric acid. Now, what is turning this protein on? What is making this protein function? Uh, it's the phosphorylation that it's receiving from the catalytic subunits of protein kinase A, okay? So this is how histamine directly regulates uh, the um, secretion of hydrochloric acid uh, by uh, the parietal cells because uh, histamine regulates how much activity the proton potassium ATPase is within the uh, apical surface of the parietal cells actually have and therefore it regulates how much hydrochloric acid is going to be secreted from that parietal cell. Okay, so that's how histamine regulates uh, the um, secretion of hydrochloric acid from uh, parietal cells. Okay, right, uh, so what I would like to discuss now is uh, some drugs which work by blocking the H2 receptor, okay? And basically, if you block the H2 receptor, then the basal level of histamine from the uh, enterochromaffin cells, sorry, the enterochromaffin-like cells, a small uh, correction there, uh, from the enterochromaffin-like cells will not be capable of stimulating the parietal cells anymore. So the stimulation of the parietal cells, that's basal stimulation, and I want to stress this is always happening. The enterochromaffin-like cells are always secreting this basal level of histamine. Okay, so let me draw this. So here's our enterochromaffin-like cell here. Okay, and all the time, okay, it's secreting a basal level of histamine. So it's secreting a little bit of histamine here. Okay, which will be stimulating the parietal cell to secrete hydrochloric acid. Okay, and now what we are going to do basically is we're going to give drugs which will stop the histamine actually being able to stimulate the parietal cells and therefore will hugely reduce the basal secretion of hydrochloric acid. Okay, so these drugs are going to be H2 antagonists, which means that they will bind to the H2 receptor Okay, they will bind at the same place that histamine would bind. So if I draw the H2 receptor here, 
Okay, so remember it's a heterotri... well, sorry, it's a G-protein coupled receptor, so it has seven uh, membrane-spanning alpha helices, like so. Here's the amino terminus, extracellularly. Here's the carboxylic acid terminus, intracellularly. And basically, these drugs will bind to the same binding site as histamine. They will not stimulate the receptor, so they will not cause the conformational change that histamine does, which... Um, allows the intracellular loops to produce a binding domain which can bind to the heterotrimeric GS, G protein. So they won't do that. So you won't get any stimulation of the heterotrimeric G protein by this uh, H2 receptor, but they stop histamine from being able to bind. Okay, so they stop the activation of these H2 receptors by histamine. And that's an important distinction between actually inhibiting the enzyme and just binding to it and stopping the um, uh, activation of that enzyme. Okay, so H2 antagonists uh, include the drug simetidine. Okay, and another very famous example is ranitidine. Okay, so both uh, simetidine and ranitidine are H2 receptor antagonists. Now, there are also related drugs, uh, nizatidine and also famotidine. Okay, so let me put these ones here. Okay, so nizatidine and also famotidine. They're also competitive H2 antagonists. Right. So all of these drugs will reduce the basal secretion of hydrochloric acid by stopping uh, the ECL cells from being able to stimulate the parietal cells, which occurs at a basal level. Okay, right. Uh, so we'll continue this discussion in the next video, where we'll discuss the G cells and gastrin.